It's usually a place of security. It's where you make your living and support your family. It's a place that most people go to every day. A place where you do not expect to feel vulnerable. It's your office, warehouse, or factory. But little do you know that tomorrow could be the day that one of your coworkers brings a gun with the motive to kill. A cold-blooded killer who seeks revenge and power. He is the workplace killer. The workplace killing is one of the newest yet most common types of mass murder. One of the more common scenarios of mass murder is in the workplace, where a former worker, or at least a disgruntled worker, wants to get even for all the mistreatment by the boss. It gives me the wrong assignments, doesn't give me the raise I deserve, doesn't appreciate all my hard work. And when this person feels that their job is on the line, they decide to fire back. They're going to be the one to do the firing, not the boss. So it's an idea of taking control of a situation where someone else has control. If you take a look at workplace killings, virtually all of them involve what I refer to in some of my own research as crimes of rage, where people are deeply resentful that they were fired or not promoted, or where they were bullied or ostracized by coworkers, made fun of. There's something about that workplace that's incendiary. It's like having a match on a fuel-soaked pile of dry wood. And this guy has got to solve this problem by getting rid of those people. And most of those perpetrators are male. Many of them were the sort of case example, the quintessential breadwinner for their families. And for things to not work out in that workplace, to jeopardize the income, to jeopardize the family well-being, is unacceptable. And these are people who may feel so worried that their family's life, their own lives, are over as they knew them, that they've got to get rid of this problem. And it's often very impulsive. It's not thought through. It's, I'm going to waste these people because they've made my life miserable. With workplace mass murders, I, I think the, the reason why that the, the loss of a job or a layoff or disciplinary action might be so catastrophic is is due to several factors one of which is that that the person or the the individuals who who commit workplace massacres the uh, they they value their job significantly and so when when they lose that for for a lot of these individuals they they are loners they don't have many friends um, this, this was one of the few things in their life that they could hold on to, and now it's being ripped, ripped away from them. Um, and, they, and there also tends to be an externalization of blame, that, that they don't, they're not accountable for their own actions. They're not, they're not accountable for their own deficiencies on the job or, or their performance on the job. Instead, it's always someone else's problem that someone else is responsible uh, for, for their, their weaknesses on the job, or someone else is responsible for, for why they're getting fired. And so in losing their job, they have one of the most important things taken away from them. They feel as though they don't have much else to live for. And because they plan on killing themselves, the thought process in a lot of instances is, well, I'm going to take down others with me, which is exactly what they did. And in the 80s, there was one job that seemed to push people over the edge, push them into a world of hate-filled rage and the bloodlust for revenge. It's a job everyone across America is familiar with and relies on. Postal workers. It's a bewildering contradiction. The mailman is everyone's friend. 
a neighborhood fixture. He's dependable, courteous, and helpful. But in the 80s, some of these dependable neighborhood icons suddenly turned murderous. And they turned local post offices into blood-soaked killing fields. Indeed, so prolific were the rampages by these men that they led to a phrase that is now chillingly understood by everyone. These killers were going postal. Many people use this phrase, it's turned into a bit of a cliche, going postal. And I think most thoughtful observers say that, well, you know, there have been a number of incidents in post offices. And as a result of this kind of critical mass of killings in those settings, this phrase has caught on. Well, what is it about that kind of setting? Post offices have a number of unique qualities. Non-stop traffic, work that doesn't end. Every time you finish one pile, there's another pile to do. There are pressures, there are supervisors saying, get it done more quickly, it's never ending, and it's intense. And I think those qualities sometimes combine to create an enormous amount of pressure. A lot of people handle that just fine. They're not rattled by that kind of pressure. You know, po post office-based murders are relatively rare. Yes, there have been a number of sad, tragic incidents in those settings, and statistically, they are very rare. There are other environments where there's nonstop pressure, where things erupt. I work an awful lot in prisons. Prisons, in some ways, have some of those same qualities. Although they're not delivering the mail, they are 24-7 operations. There's an awful lot of pressure. You, all have, you have a lot of people in a small environment, lots of interactions. You have lines of authority where people engage in conflict. Military environments, very much the same way. So where you have 24-7 operations with lots of people, with lines of authority, with the potential for conflict, where things don't slow down an awful lot. There may be some ebb and flow, but they don't slow down and they never stop. Those are the environments that I think are highest risk, which can create the climate for workplace violence, mass murder, Again, it doesn't happen that often, but when it happens, those are especially high-risk environments. So going postal, I think, is a euphemism that could be used for lots of other settings that have similar qualities. There is no doubt that these conditions contributed to the notorious 1986 rampage of one man, the deadly Patrick Sherrill. Sherrill would become not only the father of all postal killers, but the deadliest workplace killer of all time. In 1986, Patrick Sherrill killed 14 coworkers and wounded six more at the post office in Edmond, Oklahoma. And for, for Sherrill, he, he had been reprimanded by his, his supervisors uh, shortly before the incident. He was, he was known by those in his neighborhood as Crazy Pat because he was he was known as a as a peeping Tom. He was a loner who had never been married. And like other mass killers we see, uh, he he had been involved in, in the military and was able to develop his marksmanship skills, which he then put on display when he went into the post office and, and shot twenty of his coworkers. And the the, the mass murder committed by Cheryl was heavily publicized. Um, it, it had occurred two years after uh, the, the mass killing committed by James Huberty in San Ysidro, which also captured a great deal of publicity. Um, so it, it, was, it was kind of the, the defining moment uh, for, for workplace violence, uh, which, which began to receive quite a bit of attention in the late 1980s in early 1990s, but following the Cheryl incident, there, there were a number of shootings that took place in, in post offices around the country. On that early August morning, the 44-year-old Cheryl arrived at the Edmond, Oklahoma post office with a full mailbag. 
only this time there would be no mail for him to deliver. Just a pair of loaded 45 caliber handguns. He would deliver something else today, a bag full of death. A barrage of bullets meant for his unsuspecting co-workers and supervisors. For what must have seemed like an eternity to his terrified co-workers, hiding behind machinery and piles of mail, Cheryl turned the post office into a slaughterhouse. After killing 14 and wounding seven, Cheryl took the coward's way out. The way many of these workplace killers prefer, he placed a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Pat Sherrill would spawn a host of copycat postal killers, including a certain Thomas McIlvain. With Thomas McIlvain, uh, he, he, like Patrick Sherrill, was a postal worker. And he, he had been uh, disciplined in, in, uh, prior to the shootings. And he, he was upset that management had, had disciplined him. And he, too, had filed grievances beforehand. He had made threats against management. Um, and during some of these negotiations between his union and management, he, he had indicated that he was going to make Edmund look like Disneyland. He, he ended up killing uh, four and, I believe, wounding four others. So. Uh, whereas Patrick Sherrill, he, he killed 14 and wounded six. So, uh, it, it, I mean, in terms of the body count, it, it was less severe, but um, any instance in which uh, four more people lose their lives is, is, is catastrophic. Later that same year, Joseph Harris also killed four people at a post office in New Jersey. And so, Given the fact that that one particular workplace or, or, or one particular organization seemed to be disproportionately responsible for, for, for what had at that time appeared to be this epidemic of workplace violence, it kind of crystallized within, w within the public's head that, that when someone commits a workplace shooting, that they're going postal, that it, it became synonymous with workplace shootings. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how many workplace shootings there actually were from the mid-1980s through the mid-1990s, but, but there were more than enough to, uh, to, to make the connection and to, to make it seem like what, what's going on with the U.S. Postal Service that that they have these letter carriers who, who seem to have uh, hair trigger tempers who, uh, who, who go into the workplace and try to kill as many people as they can. A great example of copycatting is the Postal Service shootings in the 1980s. Uh, Patrick Sherrill was the largest, killing 14 in Edmond, Oklahoma. But following that, there were many other postal workers who identified with Sherrill, who saw him as a little guy who stood up and got even with the Postal Service, who were just unfair to their workers. McIlvain and others saw Pat Sherrill as a hero. And for a period of time, there were a large number of shootings in postal, postal facilities. And eventually, that contagion did expire. But before that contagion expired, there would be more than nine incidents at post offices, nearly every one involving mass murder, and another 14 incidents plagued other types of American workplaces. The most infamous of these was the standard gravure shooting perpetrated by Joseph Westbecker, another man hell-bent on seeking revenge. Joe Westbecker uh, worked at the Standard Graveyard plant in Louisville, Kentucky, and um, he had battled mental illness for quite some time. And in fact, due to that mental illness, he was later placed on, on disability leave. And 
he believed that his exposure to toluene, uh, which was used in the plant, was uh, responsible for the, the mental health problems that, that he experienced. And, and he, he blamed management at Standard Gravier uh, for, for his, his mental health problems. And he had filed grievances. He had made threats against uh, management at Standard Gravier for, for quite some time before the shootings actually took place. So on the morning of the shootings, when he showed up and some coworkers heard gunshots, one, one coworker in particular knew that Crazy Joe Westbecker had come back to, to make good on the threats he had made. According to Crazy Joe, only one person was allowed to do the firing. And on September 14, 1989, that's just what he did. Westbecker marched into the printing plant, armed like a soldier with an AK-47 assault rifle, two pistols, two Mac-11 machine pistols, a bayonet, and a bag full of bullets. Starting on the third floor, he began his sweep of the building and headed to the basement, taking lives as he went. He then backtracked to the first floor, where he unleashed a final hail of fury on the people he believed were the cause of all his misery. After half an hour of mayhem-filled wrath and revenge, eight innocent people lay dead and another 12 were wounded. Westbecker then turned his gun on himself and fired. Joseph Westbecker went on a rampage at the Standard Revere printing plant in, eight, in 1989. Several years earlier, there was a mass murder at the uh, McDonald's in San Ysidro, California, which was widely publicized. When Westbecker left his home to go to his former workplace, to kill eight and wound 12, he left open on the coffee table a magazine to this particular story about the McDonald's and about guns. Did the Huberty case inspire him to kill? No, he had all the reason he needed, all the anger. He had a hit list. He had been planning it for months. While he may have admired what Huberty did in the McDonald's, it wasn't the reason he killed. He killed because he had his own enemies and his own motivation and his own need for revenge before taking his own life. Soon, information surfaced stating that Westbecker's anti-depression medication led him to commit this atrocity. Dr. James Fox disagrees. It didn't take long after the shooting spree by Joseph Westbecker for the news to surface that he had been using antidepressants, particularly Prozac. And there were those who say, see, that's why he did it. He was taking Prozac, made him kill, made him homicidal, made him suicidal. But the fact is that, jo that Joseph Westberger had been planning this crime for months, long before he was prescribed and started taking Prozac. He had a hit list of people he wanted to harm. That list was created before taking Prozac. He was on the shooting range practicing. He was in the gun shop buying guns long before he started taking Prozac. Did Prozac have a role? If any role, perhaps in getting him out of the house, getting him to the point where he was able to free himself of depression and do what he wanted to do. Unfortunately for his victims, what he wanted to do was to, to kill. You can't blame the Prozac for that. Prozac did what it was supposed to do. It's also true that millions of Americans use Prozac. And should it surprise us then, given how prevalent murder is in this country, that there'd be some murderers who are using Prozac? You take any group, any selection of the population, and you'll find a fair number of people who are using antidepressants. You do that among murderers, you'll also find some people using antidepressants. Doesn't mean that the antidepressants cause the crime. In fact, the rate of murder among those using antidepressants like Prozac is actually less than the national average. Westbecker and Cheryl became the textbook examples of workplace revenge shootings. At first, 
experts speculated that the two men had simply snapped, went into a sudden spur-of-the-moment frenzy of killing. But this thinking fell apart as investigators made a startling discovery of large caches of guns and ammunition at their homes, enough to kill hundreds of people. One of the biggest misconceptions, the myths, related to mass killing is that these mass murderers go berserk, that they go bonkers, that they suddenly snap and then spontaneously kill everything that moves. It's just not true. Most of the time, they are methodical and selective in their choice of victims. Uh, there are mass killers at work who have walked around potential victims because they didn't see those particular individuals as part of the conspiracy against them. Um, and they'll, they, they, there was a, a one postal worker, Patrick Sherrill, he made a phone call to his best friend and co-worker at the post office the night before telling him not to show up. He didn't want to kill his best friend. So we are talking about mass killers who premeditate their crimes. They, they, they plan them, it may take them months to get their arsenal of weapons, their, the, the bullets they need, the, the guns that they'll need uh, to maximize the body count, uh, and they'll plan and do it, uh, wait for the optimal moment to strike so as to maximize. Criminologists continue to use Westbecker and Cheryl as the quintessential workplace rampagers. But are there cases out there that don't quite fit the mold? Some, like Alan Winterborn, have all the telltale signs. Winterborn made threats, kept an odd appearance, and had a major problem with authority. But there's one catch. How can you be a workplace shooter if you're unemployed? In 1993, Alan Winterborn uh, committed a workplace shooting in, in California. And the, the case involving Winterborn was a little different in that, that workplace, with workplace shootings, I think a lot of people think of disgruntled employees. They, they think of those who, who have been fired or who have been laid off or, or who have been disciplined. But workplace shootings can also involve uh, those who, who may not necessarily have been employed at that workplace. And in 1993, in Oxnard, California, we, we see the same thing with, with Alan Winterborn. He, he, um, he was someone who had a great deal of difficulty finding employment. And, and, and because he had so much difficulty finding employment, he blamed it on the, on the local unemployment office, which is where he carried out the workplace shooting. He, he had applied for 80 some odd jobs in, in the several years preceding the mass murder that took place in 1993, and he did not get a single job offer. And in, in Winterborn was, was a little eccentric. He had, he had ran for public office and lost. He, he had uh, an unusual appearance. Uh, which may have contributed to his difficulty of, of uh, finding employment. Um, but in 1993, he went into, into the unemployment office in, in Oxnard, California, and killed three people there at the office. And then when he fled the location, uh, he ended up killing an additional police officer before he, he, was, uh, he was killed himself. Another such case is Atlanta, Georgia day trader Mark Barton. In 1999, Barton's depraved killings showed just how complex workplace mass murder can become. Mark Barton, uh, from Atlanta, killed a number of day traders in two of the firms with which he did business. Um, he had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in day trading and somehow was able to blame other traders who hadn't lost hundreds of thousands of dollars doing the same kinds of activities. The interesting fact about Barton is that he also had killed his wife and two children. 
Some killing sprees have a mixed motive. Mark Barton, for the most part, was trying to kill people at day trading centers out of anger, hostility, revenge, envy. Yet the night before, he killed his children, his two boy and his girl. Not because he was angry at them, because he loved them. He wanted to save them the embarrassment of what was about to happen. In fact, next to his son's body, he left a note to God where he said, this is my son, my buddy, my life. Please take care of him. He killed his son not out of anger or hostility, but out of love. Jack Levin has dug further into Barton's past and believes he has killed before, possibly putting him into the category of the serial murderer. Eight years earlier, he most likely also killed his first wife and her mother. Uh, the authorities were never able to prove it, but it looks like he killed them and then married the woman who was at that time his girlfriend. Of course, she died at his hands later on. So this mass murder that he committed was not the first. In the Barton case, my understanding is this is somebody who was psychiatrically unstable and who was in deep financial trouble. He was a day trader, as I recall, who was in a big financial mess. And he's another typical example where it's important to look for combinations of explanations, not a single one-size-fits-all explanation. So in his case, what we appear to have is psychiatric instability combined with financial desperation because of his financial losses. And so sometimes what you have is a combination of two plus two that don't equal four. You have two plus two that equals nine, if you get my drift, where there's this exponential combination that leads to a mass killing. It's not just the financial trouble. It's not just the psychiatric illness. It's the combination that's particularly explosive, literally and figuratively. After the killings, Barton escaped. A lengthy manhunt ended after authorities cornered him at a gas station. Surrounded, no place to run, he calmly loaded a gun and shot himself in the head. Mark Barton's trail of death was an eerie combination of family killing and workplace vengeance that left 13 dead and 12 wounded. Of all the types of mass murder, workplace killings have decreased since their bloody peak in the 1990s. But even experts aren't so sure that the first 10 years of the 21st century are nothing more than a calm. The calm before the storm. There really hasn't been any new wrinkles, just new places. We saw recently a mass shooting at a health club. We saw a mass shooting at a rave party. Well, there represent the kinds of situations we have in modern society. What will we see in the future? No one knows. The motives will be the same. The places will be different. So for now, America is waiting, waiting for the next outbreak, the next spark to set off another contagion of workplace killings in the second decade of the 21st century. Even now, somewhere, in some office, some factory, some warehouse, Some worker is on the brink of deciding his boss and co-workers have done enough to make him miserable and is ready to go over the edge and kill.